Good morning, Calvary family, and welcome to our service today. Welcome if you're joining us in person, and welcome if you're joining us by live stream, or if you're joining us by video later on today or during the week. We are so glad to have you here, and we're looking forward to a great day today, and I hope that you're looking forward to a good day as well. Thankfully, the rain has held off, at least for now, and uh, so you got to come in dry, and uh, we're looking forward to some time together in the Word and uh, remembering what God has done and what He has spoken to us. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Psalm 19. We're going to look at Psalm 19 for our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 19. It's a kind of an interesting. I would give you just kind of a, a very quick outline of what's going on. We have around us nature speaking, and then we find that God is speaking, and then we are called upon to look at our own speech. And so in light of what we've been looking at in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, we keep this in mind. I'm actually going to be reading out of the uh, CSB uh, this morning, and uh, we'll read the entire psalm here. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Now we speak about God's words. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own heirs? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. And then we conclude with the consideration of our own words. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. And after prayer, we'll have songs. And then we'll get right into the message this morning in Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 29. God, I thank you that we can be joined together today in the Word of God, that we can be joined together uh, in the Spirit of God and in Christ, and that is our unity, that is our common bond, and we rejoice in that. And may we not forget that uh, beyond this hour, that we would remember this throughout the week, that we are together as one body in Jesus Christ, and that we are part of one another. And I pray, God, that as we look at the Word of God in a few moments after we sing, and we consider our words that we would be challenged once again when it comes to those words that come from our mouth, those words that we communicate to others. And as we look at the positive component in this week and next week, and that our words would be speaking grace, that they would be fitting, and that they would be building up one another. May your spirit have freedom to work in us and direct in us. We pray today for those who are not able to be with us in person. We pray that they would be doing well, that they would be encouraged as a result of watching and participating from a distance in our service. And I pray that those of us who are able to gather today would be also encouraged in our souls and we'd be looking to encourage others, even though the different uh, times and our ways that we interact and engage with each other are slightly different. We pray that in all that is done today, that your name would be lifted up and glorified. We do give you praise. We give you thanks in that which you are doing in our lives and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Nathan? The pastor just read in Psalm 19. Over in Psalm 119, it says, I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in your word. Let's all stand and we'll sing, Trust His Word. past and what we 
yet he offers his great wisdom, so you will not lose your way. Like a lamp, it glows every step, it shows you can know his will each day. Trust his word, trust his word. All God's and stranger he can be your closest friend and he'll always listen closely when you share your heart with him Jesus walks the path beside you he has been there all along and he'll guide your feet when you're still strength is almost gone. Trust his word. Trust his word. All God's promises are true. Trust his word. When your pathway disappears, when your joy gives way, Over in Psalm 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's sing now, Search me, O God. Try me. 
Psalm 150 is our song of the month. And is it the last Sunday of the month? Oh my goodness. It says this, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's sing that together. Thank you to our musicians this morning, and let's go ahead and get over into our Bibles in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, and we're in our third message on verse 29, and it seems like, how can you get so much from one passage, and uh, wow, what a great question, but there is so many things uh, within this verse, and so we'll look at, uh, we've been looking at kind of the negative the last two weeks, and uh, we've been talking about no corrupting communication coming out of our mouth. And we're going to look the next two weeks, today and next Sunday, at uh, kind of the positive aspect of this verse and uh, talking about that which ministers grace, that which edifies, that which is fitting. Uh, but we won't quite get to those three points today. We're going to get into really just the first couple of words uh, in the second phrase of the passage. But we've been looking at, over the last couple of weeks, uh, talking about our words. And the challenge is this, is that our words would rightly image who God is. So as you've been speaking, as you've been listening, are you a little bit more aware? Are you a little bit more attentive to what you're saying? Are you a little bit more aware and attentive to what others around you are saying? Have you had anybody say to you over the last two weeks, is that corrupting speech? Have you asked that question to anybody else? And uh, it is something that's a good reminder. 
And uh, it's, a, it's something that we need to hear and be reminded of as well. I want us also to remember the context of what is going on. The context here is that we are to minister to each other and to build each other up. That is edifying. So when we're imaging God, it's not just talking about the negative component, but if God were here speaking to us today, what would he sound like? What would he say? If he were speaking to your kids when they're disobeying throughout the week, how would he engage with your kids? This is what it means to rightly an image God in the things that we're saying. And so the context here is talking about the church, the body of Christ, speaking to one another. And remember, back in verse number 12, Paul tells us that we are being equipped to do two things. We're being equipped within the body to edify and to minister to each other. So it's no surprise that when we get to the passage here and Paul talks about our words, that he says our words should minister grace and edify. Because that is what we are doing as a church. So he's talking about not just in our actions, not just in the things that we don't do, but in our words. Are our words ministering grace? Are they building each other up? And are they fitting? So this is all within the context of the church, first and foremost. And if we are living rightly within the church, then as we move out into the, the world that is around us, the culture that is around us, and the circumstances that we find ourselves in, then we will also be speaking the way that we ought to speak. Now, one other thing, just to kind of add into this, and that is this. How many of you have recognized that you struggle with your words? Anybody identify with that, that you struggle? And I've actually overheard it, and as I've participated in life groups and people saying things along that line, like, uh, I, I knew I had a problem, but I really didn't know how bad it was. Uh, and it seems like I'm having this problem with my words, and it seems like I'm constantly being defeated. So let me encourage you with a couple very brief thoughts about the struggle. And uh, struggle with sin is actually a good thing. All right? Did you catch that? Struggle with sin is actually a really good thing. Imagine this. What if you didn't struggle with sin? In other words, what if you could sin and it didn't bother you at all? That is a huge problem. So the very fact that you struggle with sin, that you look at sin and you're like, oh, I have this problem and this bothers me and I don't want to live this way, that's actually a good and healthy thing. That's something that God does in us. It's the work of the Spirit in us prompting us about that. So we recognize that we are not perfect, that we have not mastered our mouths, that uh, we are not in total control of all that is going on. The other thing is, is that when I'm perfect, then it really do I need God. So part of our humanity, we could say it this way, part of our struggle with ongoing sin, indwelling sin and the flesh is a constant reminder that we need God. And that's actually okay because we do need God and we need to be dependent upon him. So it's also good this, that we recognize that there is a problem. We recognize that there is a sin issue going on. That's a healthy thing to know. Because again, we don't want to go through life missing out on these things. And who is it that helps us to recognize the sin problem? Well, the only reason we can recognize sin is because of God's work in us through his spirit. That's the only reason. I cannot discover sin in my life in my own ability and my own effort. That is only the work of the spirit revealing this sin in me. So it helps me to recognize this, that God is actually at work in me. When sin is being revealed, it's not intended to discourage us and frustrate us because it's all been dealt with on the cross. But it's actually there to remind us that God is actually working in us. I had a coach when I was in high school basketball and uh, he would yell. It felt like he was always yelling at me. And I remember one time that he said to me, he says, hey, if I'm yelling at you, that's a good thing because I care about you and I value you and I want to make you a better player. He says, you really ought to be concerned if I'm not yelling at you because then at that point, I don't care. So whether that's right or wrong as a coach, the point is, as we understand, is God is working in us. It's because he cares about us. He's at work perfecting us. He's at work forming us into the image of God. So we recognize this struggle. And then the last thing is that in that struggle, it's never intended to turn us inward concerning our sin, but it's always uh, uh, intent to, to direct us upward. It's always directed to turn us to Christ. So it doesn't turn us inward. At, oh, I'm so bad. I'm such a failure. I'm such a, you know, I just can't get victory in this area. And here I have fallen once again. No, the point of this is not to feel bad about yourself in that sense, but the point of this is to turn to Christ. 
And so this is always good. In the struggle with our words, or whatever it may be, anger, uh, as we've looked at already, maybe it's a struggle with speaking the truth, maybe it's a struggle with um, stealing, or whatever else it may be. And this is always good for us, even as parents, or as we engage with one another, and we're speaking to one another the truth, is that we're helping people to see that sin in our lives is actually a mark of something that is healthy in this sense, and that it teaches us that we are struggling, that we need Christ, that we haven't arrived, and that God is actually at work in us. So keep those things in mind as we think about the struggle that we have. Never to say sin is okay. That's never the point. But always to say that Christ has actually overcome sin and the work of the cross, the power of the cross in us demonstrates that victory as well. All right, so let's jump into the notes here. And just by way of introduction, do you ever think about eulogies? I used to tell this with the staff on their birthdays over the last year or so. We, we would, on the birthday, we would eulogize the person whose birthday it was. Now, that may seem like it's bizarre, but if you look up the definition of eulogy, it doesn't link it just to funerals. But that's what we're most familiar with, right? When does a person have a eulogy? Once, once they're gone, once, once they've died. Then people stand up and say all kinds of great things about it. But let me tell you something. What good is it to that person who has died that you speak all these great things about them? Does it encourage them? Does it set them up for eternity? Uh, it doesn't do anything for them, right? Uh, so the point of eulogizing is to be an encouragement and to speak well of each other before the person passes away. Speak now when it's actually helpful and profitable. So I want to just kind of use that as a brief illustration to help us remember when we talk about speaking uh, words that are not corrupt, when we talk about words that are grace, gracious words, words that minister to others, words that build up, words that are fitting, I think sometimes we're afraid to say good things about other people for fear that they might get a big head, right? So, so therefore, we just keep silent and we don't say anything. But you know, the scripture doesn't ever say, Paul doesn't say, speak words of grace that minister and build each other up, but be careful that they don't get too built up. You know, we need to allow God to do that work in them. And the reality is, is that someone who is walking with the Lord, when someone speaks well of them, it's actually extremely humbling. It is encouraging. But it's very humbling because we recognize the only reason that I am what I am, as Paul says, is because of God's grace. And so we think about this idea of eulogizing. It doesn't do any good to wait till the person is gone. Let's speak well of them now. I think sometimes as parents, we get caught up in speaking and identifying all the negative things about our kids. And that's what we actually see is the negative things. And, and then someone comes along and says, wow, you got a great kid. And you're like, yeah, you haven't seen him at home. And I think really a, probably a better way to say it is, yeah, you haven't seen them through my eyes because I only see the negative and I need someone to come along to say, look at the positive. Look at how they are behaving. Look at the words that they are using. Look at their actions. Look at their efforts. Look at how they're engaging with those that are around them. And our kids actually need to hear us speak those things that are good. It doesn't matter if your kids are 3 and 4, 10 and 12, 18 and 20, 30, 50, 70, it doesn't matter where your kids are. I mean, I'm in my 50s, and my dad will speak well of me. And it's not like, Dad, you don't ever need to say anything good about me ever again. Even in my 50s, I'm like, wow, that, that's really encouraging. That's really helpful. And uh, so we want to be speaking those things. So let's look with that in mind. Let's look at the, the second part of the phrase or the second part of the verse. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So this is what we're going to get to today. We're going to get, but only such as is good. That's all the farther we're getting today. So let's, let's uh, tie in here and see if we can get it done in two hours. All right. So, but here is a conjunction. All right. This is the prophet of learning grammar. Because when you read the Bible, it helps you understand and comprehend what's going on. This idea of this conjunction, it is a word that's used to contrast two opposing thoughts. What are the two opposing thoughts? Well, in this particular verse, the two opposing thoughts are this. On the one hand, let no corrupting communication come out of your mouth. All right? So nothing that is, that is bad, that is evil, that is wicked, that is untoward, that is hurtful or harmful towards other people. Let none of that come out. But in contrast, let only that which is good. All right, so I want you to not miss that contrast, the significance of that small word. Now, it actually links back to verse 24. 
If you go back to verse 24, Paul is telling us, he says, remember, he says, let us not walk as the Gentiles walk in the darkness of their mind, and the futility of their mind. And he goes on and he lists a number of things. But he tells us, he says, let us put off. This is the aorist tense. This is something that has been done and accomplished and continues to have effect. So at the moment of salvation, we put off the old man. The old, the old nature died to us. And we put on the new man, the new, the new nature that is in Christ. So we've put that off. Notice what he says, that the man who was put off, that old man, those things that are connected to the old man, those are corrupted things. Now, it's not exactly the same word, but it's actually closely connected. In other words, the word corrupted in verse 24 is more about the description of the person, kind of the innate person, that they are a corrupt person and they are continuing to be further corrupted. So that when we look around the world and we look back at the moment before salvation, we were not fully uh, realizing our corrupt. We are fully depra- depraved, all right? absolutely sinful, nothing good in us, but the realization of that full depravity had not yet been fully experienced. We are continuing to be further corrupted, if that's even possible, uh, in our depravity. So that, de- that corruption results in corrupt language. So in other words, we could say it this way. When Paul talks about in verse 29 at the beginning, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, he's saying, listen, this is attributed to one who is corrupt. They speak corrupting language, and we ought not be surprised. But it is not characteristic of one who is put on the new man who is formed in the likeness of God. He is not to be speaking corrupt language, but rather he's to be speaking language that is good. So we see those two things that are contrasted Verse 24, but he brings it out again in verse 29. You can actually go through and make that similar comparison when you think about our, our um, uh, speaking the truth as we look at uh, anger, as we look at uh, stealing, as we look at forgiveness in the weeks to come, as we look at wrath and malice and so forth. We'll see those things. So it's that constant back and forth. Corrupt, this is what it looks like. Those who are in Christ, this is what it now looks like. And this is how we have this contrast that's going on. So that word but is actually a really important word because it transitions from the first half of the verse to the second half of the verse. Now, let's go to the next word, but only, only. Now, remember when we went through in verse 29, let no corrupt communication. That word no, which words did that refer to? All right, I'll give it multiple guesses for you, okay? So did it, re- did it refer to 10% of your words, 50% of your words, or 100% of your words? 100%. So Paul says there's no room in the life of one who is in the image of God for any corrupt communication. There is no room for any corrupt communication, none whatsoever, none, no. Absolute no, there is nothing there. Now, the contrast here is this, is that only is parallel to that no, and it is this, that every word is to be good. All right, does that seem like an impossible task to you? (laughs) It should, it should. Think about this, the average person, and I know that some may argue with this, but this is, this is straight off Google, so I know it's true. So the average person speaks about 7,000 words a day, And, and believe it or not, men, all right, science shows that women don't actually speak more words than we do. All right, you just act like you don't talk when you go home. That's the problem. So the average person speaks 7,000 words a day. Now, we're just talking about verbal communication, but if we look at the word communication, it references all forms of communication. Boy, if you put all that together, and if somehow you could categorize and quantify our facial expressions that say a lot, even though we don't say anything, that actually would add to that total. But let's just take our verbal words And we think about this, 7,000 words a day. And just rough estimates here. I know if you multiply 7 times 7,000, it's 49. I know it's 49,000, but we're just going to call it 50,000, all right? A little bit of latitude there. So 50,000 words a week. Now, of the 7,000 a day, how many of them are to be good? 7,000. Of the 50,000 words per week, how many of them are to be good? 50,000. All right, now if you're quick, you're multiplying it out already to a year, and you know this, in a year you're going to speak 2.6 million words. Now which of those words are to be good? 
All of them. Anybody feeling overwhelmed? Anybody already feeling like a failure? Remember the point back in the introduction about our struggle with sin. It's a constant reminder to come back to Christ and his work in us. All right, now if you want to spread this out to 65 years old, all right, so this is with the assumption, or 65 years of speaking, that you live to 70. Some of you are already beyond that. Uh, but you live to 70 and you didn't start speaking until you're five, okay? So that's when we're going to start counting that. That is 169 million, 169,000 million words. Is that right? I'm getting all it. One, six, nine, zero, 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 zero. Add it up. It's all right. Say it what you're supposed to say. It. That's a lot of words. And that's if they're only saying 7,000 a day. And which of those millions of words are to be good? Every single one. Would you say that God's expectation is pretty high? It is. And this is why we come to the realization that, you know what? None of us can do anything that is good in our own ability you just think about words and you think about it in relationship to sin and whether or not a person is really good and what makes a person not good it is failing just one place one time so you take all of your words that you say in your entire lifetime those millions of words and how many words does it take to condemn you as unholy and not good before god one just one just one out of all those millions, and then you stand condemned. Now, the reality is we stand condemned before we even speak. But when you find people who try to say, no, I'm good, all right, what is the standard for good? It's not our own man-made standard. It's not my own condition for what is good, but God's standard is this, absolute perfection. Now, you think about this and expand it out just a little bit further. God, who has spoken for all of eternity, how many words has he spoken? Wow, that's a lot of words. And he continues to speak. So think about this. Never in the history of God, which goes back forever, never in the current time of God, and never in the future of God, which will go on forever, will he ever speak a word that is not good. Does that kind of blow your mind a little bit and kind of like, wow, that is an amazing thing. Here I am. I struggle just getting through the next five minutes with good words. And God for all of eternity has spoken that which is good. So we are only to have words that are building up, words that are fitting, words that are ministering to those we speak and to those that we hear, uh, uh, those that hear us speak. So again, this is a very high standard and one that we recognize I can't achieve it on my own. I am absolutely dependent upon God to do this work in me. So as we consider these words that we speak, so many of these words, he says there is to be no corrupting language and stating it positively that it's to minister grace, that it's to edify, it's to be fitting. How is what I'm about to say edifying, fitting, and ministering grace? This is kind of like the checkpoint as we're going through the week. The words that I'm about ready to say, are these words fitting? Now, we talked a little bit about this last week. We think about that question. Are the words I'm about ready to say fitting, gracious, and ministering, and edifying? Nope, but it doesn't matter because I'm just going to say it because it's really all about me and how I feel and what I need to get off my chest. It's not about you, but the whole idea of Scripture is that it's about those that we're ministering to, those that are around us. How will those I'm speaking to directly receive it? This will tie into that idea of fitting because sometimes the words that we say, we say, well, they're true and they're actually loving words but there's actually this qualification. Is it fitting for the time? Is this what they actually need to hear now? If you read the book back in January uh, by Michael Imlet, he talks about the sufferer, saint, and sinner and, and talking about how we address each of those people. If you read the book Loving Messy People in the month of March, he talked about four different categories of people, those who need hope, those who need to be confronted in their sin, those who need to be affirmed in their walk with the Lord, and then those who need to be instructed. So there we have kind of seven different ideas about how we speak and the things that we're about ready to say and how they actually fit into that. Here's another thing. How will those who overhear me speaking actually receive it? So as I'm speaking to my wife or to my husband, how will my kids receive what I'm saying? How will my spouse receive what I'm saying? How about my coworkers? How about my boss? Are there certain things that you would say to your coworkers 
uh, when your boss is not around and certain things you would say to them when your boss is present. So what is it that we're about ready to say and how about those who hear, how will it affect them? See, our words reflect our heart. We talked about this a great deal last week. In essence, Paul is stating here that our hearts are to be continually full of attitudes and thoughts that are encouraging, fitting, and ministering grace. Because this, when it comes out of my, my mouth, what have I actually revealed? I've revealed what's going on in my heart. And if I'm speaking words that are corrupt, then I'm speaking words that come out of a heart that is corrupt. That is, that it's behaving as a believer in a corrupt manner. And I'm patterning myself after those who are the Gentiles, those who are non-believers. And so if we're talking about this, it's not like I have to watch what I'm saying. That's not the point. If that's what we walk away with after reading through Ephesians 4 and 29 over this month, if we walk away and just say, I need to be more careful about what I say, you've missed the whole point. Because the whole point is this, what we need to get to is the heart of the matter. And when I am struggling to speak well, it's not a problem with my mouth, it's actually a problem with my heart. And that's where I need to begin addressing the issue. Not changing my, vernac- my, my vocabulary or my vernacular or even changing my accent or changing my attitude when I'm speaking, but it actually begins in the heart. This is where we see Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This is the one who is the judge. We spoke about judge being judged last week. K loss, K, K cost. Worthwhile, worth less. We will never be judged for our sin. That was dealt with on the cross. But we will still be held accountable for the words that we say and will be rewarded accordingly. So what will your vocabulary award or reward look like? Whatever is in our heart actually comes out of our mouth. You, you can't cover it up. It will be revealed. If anger is in our heart, then guess what will come out? Angry words. It's not the circumstances that cause my anger. It's not the people around me that cause my anger. It's not my stress. It's not my sleeplessness. It's not my, my food but rather it is rooted in my heart. And the circumstances simply draws out what is in my heart. And it reveals what's in my heart. But the contrast is true as well. If love and grace, mercy, patience, honor, kindness, humility, gentleness is in our heart, then when we speak, we will speak with those words that reflect our heart. Do you ever hear someone speak I've told you before about Sue Dolan. It was a lady that was connected to Calvary over the years, a long time ago when I was a kid. And I remember just sitting and listening to her talk. And, and as a 10 or 11-year-old kid, to sit there and want to listen to a lady who was you know, 70 or 80 years old, that was highly unusual. But I loved listening to her. I loved listening to her pray. And I thought in my mind, I want to pray like her. I want to be able to pray like that. And so we can go through and we can mimic those kinds of prayer. But the truth is, what I ought to have desired was her heart, because she was only speaking what was being revealed in her heart. And so it is the heart of the matter that we want to get to. The circumstances, again, don't dictate these responses, a response of love, a response of kindness, a response of gentleness, or whatever it may be, but rather the heart. Now, there are always exceptions, right, where certain circumstances we can elicit this perfect response because it's all fitting. But if you really dig into it, you'll find that it's actually still rooted in the heart. I like this situation, this person appeals to me, therefore I speak well to them. Okay, well, what's going on in your heart? Yes, you have love, but it's actually a self-centered love because through that, you believe you can get something from that person or that person's going to do something from you. They're going to affirm you. They're going to make you something that you need and desire. It's not because you desire the Lord. So a heart that speaks well is a heart that is actually focused on God. That is a heart that is being transformed by him. We'll get to more of that when we get to the word good in just a second. So there's in this a personal responsibility and intentionality. I was reading this past week in a book on anger. I've continued to study that in my own life. And, and the author goes through. We, we understand blame shifting, don't we? So Adam and Eve in the garden. God, it's the woman you gave me. So Adam shifts the blame to Eve but surreptitiously actually shifts it to God. God, you made her. You gave her to me. She's the one who caused me to sin. So Adam really was saying, God, you caused me to sin, which is, uh, again, just blows my mind, but I'm the same way. 
But have you ever heard of blame sharing? This actually sounds a little bit more spiritual. I'm willing to take my responsibility as long as, Stacy, you take your responsibility in this as well. That's blame sharing. There's nothing spiritual about it. It is completely self-centered. It is completely anti-God. It is completely sinful. That, that is just a justification. Like, okay, I'll, I'll take my stuff, but you better take your stuff. No, that's not true humility. That's not true repentance. That's not taking responsibility for our words. Because when it comes to our words and speaking good, we want to blame. If that person would not speak that way to me, I wouldn't speak this way to them. Or it's kind of like, okay, I'll own what I said, but they have to own what they said too. And we're putting conditions on our repentance and confession, which is not repentance, which is not confession at all. True confession and true repentance is completely vulnerable saying, it is me, it is my sin, I must deal with it. God, you must deal with my own heart. So here's the reality. Each one of us, and these are some of the really basic, each one of us have the ability to communicate with words. Not, not a single one here. There may be someone sitting here saying, well, I'm just kind of a quiet person. Personally, I don't honestly believe that. I believe in the right environment, right situation, you will speak plenty. I've seen that. I've, I've seen that time and time again. People are like, you know, I don't speak in a Bible study because, you know, I'm just not the kind of person who likes to speak. But you get them around a cup of coffee, you get them around some food, and you start talking about this or talking about that, and they won't shut up. And you're like, I thought you didn't like to talk. And really, the reality is, is it's the subject matter. What is the subject? I don't like to talk about that. I don't like to talk about this. I don't want to risk this at this point. My point is not to condemn that, but here's the point, is that we all communicate with words. And therefore, this is the point. We must look for opportunities to positively, positively speak to others. We, we tend to take uh, good work and ministry of others for granted. Isn't that true? Until the person doesn't show up. You know, when do we really care about James? Is it every Sunday when he's here and he's got the video up and he's got the songs where they're supposed to be and the sound is working? Or is it the Sunday when everything kind of falls apart? Some people are live streaming. A couple weeks back, live stream didn't work. At that point, you all of a sudden are aware of James. But when everything is running smoothly, no one's aware of James. Who's James? James who? Right? And, and too often, this is the way we live life. It's not until things go contrary to the way we want it that all of a sudden we recognize the people. But part of what Paul is teaching us here is we need to look for opportunities to speak well of other people. And, and not sarcastic like, hey, Alex, so great that you're standing here holding up the door jam today. Thanks for being here. Mm, that's probably more corrupting words than fitting words. But it's truly saying, you know what, Alex, thanks for being here today and helping to make sure everything's running smoothly. Uh, thanks, ladies, for checking my temperature as, you, as we come in so that everybody can remain safe. You know, those kinds of ideas, those kinds of thoughts, but we are intentionally looking for those people, and too often we feel entitled. Yes, they better take my temperature. They better greet me when I come in. They better seat me where I want to sit. And I'm just using church as an example since we're talking about church and since we're in church. But we often feel entitled, and refusing to speak well to people develops a sense of entitlement. This is why when I was a kid and I was growing up and my dad at the end of the meal, he'd say, what do you say to your mom after she had cooked? Thank you, mom. Was it always heartfelt and genuine? No. Um, but it was good teaching for my dad to say to us, listen, you need to understand that you must be grateful. Don't be entitled. Don't think that your mom owes you a meal at the end of the day. She doesn't owe you anything. So don't treat her like she owes you. Don't be entitled. And what would happen if we would stop treating each other in that way? Like we're entitled to what they do for us. Whether it has to do with laundry at home, dishes at home, cooking at home, cleaning the house at home, filling the car up with gas, taking car of the, care of the car, paycheck, whatever it may be. Do we treat them as though we're entitled and we're deserving? If we ought to be looking for words and saying, you know what, thank you. Thanks for going to work. Thanks for the money. Thanks for providing for groceries. Thanks for providing for clothes. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for doing that. And it's speaking words that are positive and good. Here's the third point, is that we must do it. You know, we could all leave here with a good intention that this week we're going to say something good to someone else, but if we don't do it, it doesn't do anybody any good. It's actually not obedience. It's like the son who said, yes, I'll go out and work the field, Dad, but he comes back and he hasn't done it, and he never accomplishes it. As opposed to the son who says, no, I'm not going to do it, but then has a change of heart and he repents and he goes and actually works in the field. 
And it's the same thing for us. Too many times we leave here with good intentions without true transformation. So we must go. We must go and speak. Intentionally do this. Put it into practice. Don't wait till tomorrow, but begin even at the amen and start speaking well. When was the last time that we did speak words that ministered and edified? Over this past week, your 7,000 words that you used, what percentage of them were actually good for the purpose of ministering to others? What words built others up? Who was encouraged? Who was, who was encouraged in their walk with the Lord because of your words this past week? And then recognize this, that God puts people into our life. Too many times we go and we look for this big dramatic response. And I think back over my life and there are times I get discouraged because God gives me an opportunity to speak to someone and it doesn't seem like there's any impact whatsoever. But too often we miss over that God sometimes just wants us to say a word to them. And God is at work and he's building up over time and using these words that are spoken into the lives of these people throughout these times, bringing them to this point where they finally turn to him or they finally find hope in Christ. So who is God leading you to speak to and what are you going to say in that moment? Are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you willing to say what needs to be said, what God is leading you to say? And then how can we use the truths of scriptures to ground what we are saying? Now, when we get into this, and we're going to talk more about that in just a second, but when we get into this, we recognize this, just as we've said already throughout the verse, every form of communication here, not just our words, our texts, our emails, our posts, our likes, our dislikes, or whatever else it may be, we can use every form of communication in a way that helps or encourages people. This includes what we communicate in our thoughts, so what we're saying to ourselves about other people. This communicates, this includes what we communicate actually to people. And I actually like what was brought up in one of the life groups this past week, and they were talking about this. Not only what we say directly to people, but what we say about people. Are these words corrupting words? Are they words that are good and fitting and helpful? Is it kind of like, yeah, that person's a nice guy, but... Okay, are the words you're ready to say following that conjunction... Words that are corrupt or words that are edifying. So what are we going to say? And this is where we begin speaking about other people. So what we're communicating about them. The words here that we see are the words that are good. This is the word kalos, as I was referencing a moment ago. That which is worthwhile, that which has eternal value, that which is beautiful. In other words, we could ask it this way. Are the words I'm about ready to say, the words I'm about ready to text, that I'm about ready to email, that I'm about ready to post, are these words that I want repeated in eternity? Are these words that I can anticipate that God will speak to me? Are these words that I can anticipate speaking in front of him? And after all, we are speaking in front of him continually. Are they worthy words? Think about these, and I'm going to read off a very fast list here. Words that I would qualify as worthy words, worthy words. Gratitude and thanks. Encouragement in that which is good. Respect and honor. Words that are helpful or kind. Truthful and genuine. Words that are wisdom, that is God's wisdom. Words of comfort and health. Reproof and redirection. Remember, we talk about that word reproof, and we always think of this negative thing, but sometimes just come along and saying, hey, remember, this is what God says. And that is reproof. It's reminding, it's encouraging, it's pointing back to who God is. So reproof and redirection, edifying and uplifting, friendly and generous. Are your words generous towards other people? expecting, anticipating the best? Are your words compassionate? Are they full of empathy and sympathy? Patient, long-suffering, grace and mercy, loving and gentle, soft and peaceful. And it's a long list there and fast through it, but it gets us thinking, what are the words that I'm saying? And so here's really a question that we conclude with. How do we identify what is good? How can we know what is good, all right? Is this a good word or is this not a good word? Is this a good thing for us to get involved with speaking, or is this not a good thing to get involved with speaking? And let me go to one passage. We only have time for one passage. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Probably familiar with it, almost too familiar with it at times. But Paul writes here, and he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good 
and acceptable and perfect. So Paul actually answers this question, how do we know what is good? And there's kind of a process here that we go through. Number one, when we start talking about what is good, the question we ask ourselves is, have I actually yielded myself fully to God? In other words, we could say it this way, an unbeliever has no ability to speak what is truly good. Now, they can say good things because of common grace. But good as far as honoring and glorifying to God, because that's ultimately what good is. When we think about that, an unbeliever cannot do it. Only one who is a believer. But think about this a little bit further, that if I have not yielded myself to God and, and fully sacrificed myself to him, then I won't be able to speak that which is good either. Because I'm operating out of a heart that is self-centered, that is seeking my own way, that is desirous of my own things, that is worshiping something other than God. And a heart that is worshiping something other than God cannot understand what is actually good. Because in order to do that, God must be at the center of our lives. And this is the transformation that he talks about. So there's a dying to self in verse number one. In verse number two, he talks about a transformation that takes place that results in the renewing of our mind, a transformation of our mind. And this takes place through a couple of things. One, submission. This is already what we've been speaking about in verse one. Bringing ourselves under the word of God. Bringing ourselves under the word of God. That is a willingness to be taught and a willingness to be instructed. We often talk about getting into the scriptures on a regular basis. And I would say on a daily basis, we ought to be in the word of God. Why? Because our minds need to be renewed. We need to have a transformation taking place. And when we consider this, that the majority of people spend probably less than 15 minutes of time in the word of God, and the rest of the 24 hours of the day, they're being inundated with corrupting things, things that oppose what they just heard in the word of God and what they've seen in the word of God, we absolutely need to be in the word of God. And it's so amazing how many times that we as believers, we want to argue our points, we want to defend our positions, we want to make and justify our lifestyle but all apart from the word of God. Yet it is in the word of God that God has actually spoken. And have you ever thought about why God spoke to us? When God spoke to the people of Israel and he gave the 10 commandments that we often are familiar with, it wasn't like God just trying to control and manipulate the people. He was telling the people, he says, this is what people who are godly people, people who are my people, this is what they live like. And this is the most liberating and freeing and, and faithful and joyful life that you can possibly experience. It wasn't as though God was saying, let me see how I can figure out to make your life miserable. Let me see how I can just kind of mess you up so that you can be different from everybody else. Why? Because those who live to themselves are captives to themselves. They are actually in bondage. But in Christ, we've been set free. And in the word of God, we find out about how God has actually set us free. And so therefore, when we avoid the word of God, we're saying simply to God, I'm not interested in what you have to say. I can handle this on my own. And then it's no surprise that when we get into crisis and maybe we sit down and try to say, here's what the word of God actually says, that we're like, well, I'm not really interested in the word of God because we have no life history of submitting ourselves to the word of God. If you're struggling understanding and grasping what the word of God says, it's likely because you're not in the word of God on a regular basis. You're not bringing yourselves under. Whereas I've seen on the contrast where I will take the word of God to someone and I'll say, this is what the word of God says. And because they're faithfully in the word of God, they are quick to submit and bring themselves under. And they will say, oh, I see what God says. I will bring myself under. So there's submission. Number two, there's obedience. Doing what we know. I, I was reading this this past week in another book. I can't remember the name of the book off the top of my head, but I was pointing back to James chapter 4. And there's an interesting little phrase there that God opposes the proud, the pride, the pride prideful, those who are proud. He says he opposes them. Now, this is kind of a fascinating point because the author was saying it this way. He says, listen, have you ever found yourself frustrated in everything that you do in life? It's like nothing comes together. He said, we ought to step back and say, am I prideful in my life and opposing God who then says, if I'm prideful in my life, and seeking my own desires, he will oppose me. He'll oppose me on every possible direction. For what? To make my life miserable? No. To bring me back to him. To bring myself and humble myself before him, where he says that he will then exalt us. And that word exalt is not to lift us up so everybody can praise us. That word exalt actually is linked to this very idea where he says that our desires will be accomplished. And that God will be the one who does that. So this is a fascinating thing, that if I refuse to obey and submit myself to God, don't anticipate that God will bless our lives. 
He's going to be opposing us because we're at enmity with him because we're seeking our own way. We're going about our own desires. So there's submission to the word of God. There's obedience to the word of God. And the reality is this. There is no renewing of the word of God in our life if we're not going to be obedient to it. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option to us. It's what we must do. And then we talk about the power of the spirit. This is the enablement to obey. The renewing of our minds takes place by the spirit. He is the one who transforms us. He enables us to obey and to depend upon him. And then the result of this is what? We will know the will of God. So many times we want to know what the will of God is and we want to jump everything else. God, I want to do my own thing, but tell me what your will is. It doesn't work that way. There's an Old Testament passage that talks about the priests and the leaders of Israel who come to the prophet. I think if I remember right, it's Jeremiah. And they come to Jeremiah. Now, on the side, they're worshiping all these false gods. They're still going through all the temple rituals, but they're also worshiping those false gods. And they come to Jeremiah and they say, tell us what God has to say to us. And God says, I will not speak to them. You know, I remember reading that passage. I'm thinking, this is odd. They're coming and asking God to speak to them. But the problem was, is that their hearts were turned from God. They were already worshiping their own false God, and they just wanted a word from God as well, and they wanted to hear from him. In other words, they wanted to uh, bake their cake and eat it too, if we could put it in our common vernacular. They wanted to do their own things, plus get God's blessing. And God says, I will have nothing to do with you. I will not show you anything. I will not reveal anything to you because your hearts are turned from me. And it's actually the same for us. We struggle with understanding what is good because our hearts are actually turned from God. We have not brought ourselves under the word of God. We've not submitted ourselves to what he is speaking to us. We are not obeying what we know to obey. We're refusing to yield to the Holy Spirit and our minds, therefore, are being corrupted by the world that is around us as opposed to being renewed. Now, this is extremely confrontational. This is extremely convicting, but it is something that we must address in our own life. If we're going to have conversation as a church, if we as a church are going to be able to edify and minister to one another, then we as a church, we must be submitted and obedient and allowing the Spirit to work in us in order that God may conform us and transform us and affirm into us so we know what is actually good. Do you want me speaking on Sunday morning out of a heart of wickedness and idolatry? Do you want me standing up and expounding on the word of God and a heart that throughout the week is just focused on my own self? Well, I hope that you would not. But the truth is, do you want to hear from other people in our church who are speaking into your life who are idolatrous and seeking their own desires as well? I don't want to be part of that. And therefore, why should I be idolatrous in my life trying to speak into your life when I really don't even know what is good myself because I refuse to bring myself under God himself? So in order for us to understand what is good, this idea, but only that which is good, we must be allowing God to work in and through us, in his word, in our obedience, by the power of the Spirit, so that we can know what is the will of God, what is good, and what is perfect. God, I pray that as we look at this and we consider this in our own lives, that we would be very open to your spirit. There, there's things that we need to consider. We need to, before you, God, be asking you to work in us, that we would be submissive to you, that we would be obedient to you, that we would be in the word of God, allowing it to transform our thinking through the power of your spirit so that we can know what is good. Our desire is to be obedient to the word of God. I trust that's what our desire is, God. And the only way we're going to know what is good is by bringing ourselves in line with what the Word of God says. As we look down to next week and we think about that which is fitting, we think of that which is ministering grace, and we think about that which is building up, the only way we can know that is if we ourselves are actually in the Word of God and allowing you to work in and through us. So I pray that you'll take this Word and that you will convict and that you'll prompt and that we'll be quick to repent and we'll be quick to turn to you and submitting ourselves to you and allowing you to transform our hearts, our minds, our thinking, so that we can speak only that which is good to those that are around us. We thank you, God, again, for your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thanks so much.